All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 3, XML, where we finally provide means of persisting data beyond simply using the session object. What that means, we'll get to in just a bit. But first, a couple of announcements. So Project 1 uh, went out today, since Project 0 was due today. Pizza ML is all about, recall, uh, implementing an e-commerce websites of sorts that will allow a local pizza shop to accept online orders. Um, Quite sadly, one of your classmates pointed out to me over email a couple days ago that the pizza joint closed a few weeks ago. Apparently it closed for renovations and apparently a sign on the door now indicates that it's, it's not going to reopen, which is rather sad because otherwise I would have had pizza from this place for you here tonight. Um, but uh, hopefully it's the thought that counts and the problems that will still count. I simply went in and reworded some things. So now it will be more of a make-believe problem set rather than uh, the actual pizza place being the, the target of your code. Um, so three aces will be the focus. You'll see on the last page of this handout, if you have a printout of you, uh, with you tonight, uh, available by the windows on the way in, this is the menu that will soon be in electronic form. And the form in which we'll be storing this data will ultimately be XML. And that will be one of the topics for tonight's discussion. Uh, a couple of announcements, though, administratively. Uh, so one of our teaching fellows who you met uh, two weeks ago, Alex, is not with the course. He decided to focus on his own study. But we now have Kent, who uh, will step up here for just a moment, if you wouldn't mind, and say a quick hello. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Kent. Uh, I'm a sophomore here at Harvard, a CS concentrator. Um, I also worked with David last semester on CS50, so pretty common theme, I guess, in looking at TS for this course. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with all of you this semester. All right, excellent. Then, well, thank you very much. So tonight's section will actually be led by me. It will be a brief section because you literally just got this problem set. But what we'll do is get you started logistically if you choose to stick around, just to give you a few pointers before, say, this coming Wednesday's section, uh, which is not only held on campus, recall, but also filmed. Uh, of course, if you tried to tune in last week to the live streaming uh, feed, you failed, since I, like an idiot, forgot to provide the URL for doing so. Uh, but that is now on the website under the sections page. So if you can't come to campus this Wednesday in person, by all means, hop on the course's website at, uh, at 7.35 PM. Um, there's a link now that's right there. And you can watch live. It's about 5 to 30 second delay. Um, but uh, that one will be led by Jesse this week. And then, of course, Chris, who lives in Philadelphia, will be leading our online section via Illuminate, the virtual terminal room of the course, uh, this Thursday at 8.35. So all that scheduling information is on the course's website. So we'll start off slow and briefly tonight. But presumably, you'll have a couple days then before Wednesday day to really start diving into the project. And I should point out now quite clearly that this project is meant to be a, an actual project that will take much more time than Project Zero, but the returns we think will be much higher. So please do not leave this to the very last weekend before it's due. These projects, as I said in uh, Lecture Zero, are really meant to be done over the course of three weeks, not uh, over the course of one weekend. So with that said, um, let's try to tie in, tie together a few topics. But oh, one last note, if I may. Uh, one of your classmates posted to the course's bulletin board this wonderful idea in the other category. Uh, this is actually relevant to all of you in this room. Uh, but if you're not in this room and live in the DC area, do check out this post. A student who's a distance student has suggested getting together, uh, perhaps virtually or even physically, for a study group of sorts to talk about the course over the course of the semester. And for those of you certainly in this room or out of this room, if you'd like to reach out to uh, one another, by all means do so via the course's bulletin board. And lastly, do note, one, the existence of this bulletin board, which will become an increasingly useful resource, we hope, and also that there are scribe notes, thanks to one of our teaching fellows that accompany each of the lectures. So a few days after each video goes up, we will also post scribe notes, which are designed to be, one, references for you, uh, certainly as the semester progresses. So you don't have to, for instance, rewatch a two-hour lecture to get at some uh, hopefully helpful information. Um, but also meant to be good uh, references later in the term when you want to just quickly look back at some tidbit, some code snippet. And ultimately, it's meant to relieve you of, I think, the tedium of head down scribbling on paper during lectures. It's much more interesting, more fun, I hope, to engage a bit more intellectually than worrying about scribbling down each and every little thing that we do. So know that that resource exists. So. Uh, Cascading style sheets is not something we focus on in the course, because we focus ultimately more about things programmatic than aesthetic. Um, but several of you have had questions about our promotion of YUI, the Yahoo User Interface Library, which we were just sort of arbitrarily um, expected to include in Project Zero, really for the sake of familiarity. Um, because one of the themes of the course is 
in emphasizing the cross-platform nature of website development so that you're actually testing your code on multiple browsers, which is certainly good practice, but also recognizing the reality that there are several popular browsers out there today. And even though we've come a, uh, pretty far since the 90s when it was really a mess in terms of standards or lack thereof and inconsistencies, frankly, there's perhaps just as many headaches still today in subtle, perhaps, um, inconsistencies across browsers. Just to illustrate a minor example, but that's representative of the stupid things you bump into over the course of website development, I whipped up this very quick page which has simply a div element and a little CSS that makes this div element obviously green um, with pretty large text. And just to show you what I did, here's the page source for this file. And the source code will be left on the course's website under lectures. It's very simple. So notice the div element. I assigned it a CSS class. And then up top, I specified that that class should take on a background color and a particular font size. If you're not familiar with CSS, that's fine. You can certainly get by through the whole course without worrying about this. But if you're trying to sort of raise your own bar during the semester and trying to pick up new things, know that this is a very simple and standard way of just stylizing text without actually putting the stylization in line in your XHTML per se. Um, but notice this. In Firefox, there is this slightly white border around the div. Even though this is the only thing Thing in the file, uh, even though you have no other content, you have no explicit padding, no explicit margins, there's sort of a white border on the left, on the top, and on the right. And I pulled up this same file in, uh, let's say, Safari, and you see the same thing there. I pulled it up in Chrome, and you see the same thing there. I pulled it up in Internet Explorer, and you see the same thing there, but it's a it's a quick one. You have to be a particularly anal developer to notice these things, perhaps. So before, after, right, it's just bigger. Like, it's just hard, uh, a taller white space on the top. So focus on the top. Pretty large, pretty small. Pretty large, pretty small. And it's these stupid things that you bump into when you're trying to be particularly precise when it comes to design. So one of the things, and one of the greatest things that YUI CSS libraries do is they try to level the playing field such that no matter what browser you're on, if you include that small snippet of code at the top of your file, it tries to level the playing field by standardizing the behavior of some of these most basic elements. So that when you actually include YUI, one, you get rid of that margin, which is the result of each of those browsers having a margin property on the body element by default in the web page. So what YUI has simply done is said on the body element, give it a margin of zero pixels instead of whatever the actual default is. And now if we pull up this same file in these various browsers, you see that finally we've gotten rid of that border entirely. And even if that wasn't so much the goal, what we've at least done now is standardize what the exact behavior is on each of these browsers. And so frankly, I personally use YUI all of the time for simple, stupid things like this. But the library itself is much more comprehensive. And when we get to the JavaScript portion of the course, we'll look back at it as well, because it, like a lot of libraries out there now, uh, MooTools and jQuery, all of which we'll discuss briefly, um, there's a wonderful set of widgets and tools that come with these libraries that allow you to um, avoid having to re-implement the wheel to do some very useful, some very simple tasks. Like if you want to implement tabs within your own website, well, with YUI, as with some of these other libraries, you just instantiate a tab object of sorts. And you got it. You don't have to go figure out how to implement these things yourself. But the reset library that we pushed you toward and the font library, are really, again, about labeling the playing field. And it's just a nice way to start from a very clean slate. So um, moving forward, though, project one, you are free not to use them if you wish, uh, but certainly feel free to use them. And just to give you a sense of how this thing even works, it's actually fairly simple. If I go to the Yahoo uh, Reset Library, I'm just going to go ahead and grab its URL here. It's nice, too, incidentally, that Yahoo uh, hosts these files for you. Google also hosts the same thing, because you don't have to then pay for the bandwidth. And in theory, if other websites are using the same library, it means they're presumably cached in your user's browsers, which, again, is a win. So Yahoo and a few of these entities are hoping that this notion catches on. It's a little hard to read in the minimized form. So the min has been minified, something we'll talk about in JavaScript as well. But if I pull 
up this version, you'll just see that there's not a huge amount in this file, but among the thing it, things it does at the very top is it makes the body element, the div element, and all these other elements have a margin of zero, padding of zero. So a student asked on the bulletin board, I think, recently, couldn't I just copy and paste this into my own CSS file? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, the license attached to this thing encourages precisely that. So any questions on just CSS or Yahoo? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. So that was a recurring theme, too. And I worried that maybe I might have misspoken at one point. So the course, at least, does not expect C validity of CSS, largely because of issues like that. I think I did po put a slide up that had a link to the CSS uh, validity checker. But do realize that it's not expected, because you'll run into um, headaches like that. But XHTML validity, we do expect. So don't worry about that, though, with CSS. Other questions? Yeah. So question for the camera is, do we discourage formatting with tables as opposed to using CSS proper? So personally, I am a fan of doing what gets the job done the quickest and the most reliably. Um, there are some design zealots out there that would say it's completely ridiculous to continue using tables. Frankly, I use a mixture of the two. There are layouts that I simply have never been able to get perfect across multiple browsers unless I resort to using a table. Um, sometimes the alternative is to write long lines of JavaScript code to actually fix the formatting issues for you. Um, we as a course do not fundamentally care. Um, we will try to be as sort of compliant with current trends as possible. But frankly, even I use invisible tables sometimes because it's just easy and it works. But you do, I mean, we will also preach in this course uh, matters of accessibility and trying to avoid interfering with screen readers for users who might be blind and such. So there are, I think, some compelling reasons to be careful. Um, but certainly don't think that uh, it's complete blasphemy from the course's perspective to use tables. In fact, the course's website uses a couple invisible tables because it gets the job done nicely. Other questions? Okay. Feel free to uh, uh, rant on the course's bulletin board if you would like about uh, various design decisions as those. Okay, so tonight we're going to use the course's own website as a um, starting point to discuss some of the topics that we'll be introducing both this lecture next and in the weeks to come. And I thought I'd draw your attention first to this little file here. So never mind how the particular course's file system is structured, but know that we've got a directory in our home directory uh, called etsy slash xml. And in this xml directory, we have a whole bunch of configuration files. We have one for lectures. We have one for grades and resources and sections. And these are just some proprietary quote unquote config files that we came up with that automate the process of generating certain pages on the course's website, ultimately because it took us less time to write a few lines of code that parse these files and spit out XHTML automatically than it would for us every week to go in and start manually editing XHTML, which again sort of commingles data and aesthetics, which in the long run tends to work against you. So we have, for instance, this lecture file, which looks a little ugly at this font size, but you can kind of infer, even if you've never seen XML before, and I think I did bring a snippet of this on the board a while ago, that there's this element, this tagged element up top called lectures. Nested inside of that is a, a singular lecture element. And then inside of that is a whole bunch of stuff associated, so far as you can tell, with a lecture. The title of it, the dates of it, uh, the resources associated with it. And in turn, under resources are a whole bunch of resource elements. And again, that we just kind of arbitrarily de decided would have uh, one or more formats associated with them. And this was an evolution. We decided that on the course's website, we wanted every lecture to appear with its name in bold and then the date below it and then all of the handouts and such that we made available. But anytime there's a handout that comes in different formats, like the screen friendly and the printer friendly, we don't want it to have just another line item in the web page. We wanted to go laterally. So we have lists separated by little vertical bars. So again, if you've not looked recently, this file's purpose in life is to facilitate generating this particular page, which is all XHTML and CSS, but the data itself is not stored in this index.php file, but rather in the XML file that we're looking at. So one of the goals for tonight is going to be to uh, understand, one, 
what XML is and what you can actually use it for.、Um, and there's some really interesting aspects of it that are not perhaps、uh, manifest on first glance. And two, talk about some of the libraries that exist built into PHP that just make this a wonderful alternative to the more heavy handed approach of setting up a MySQL database or a Postgres database or Oracle or anything like that. So, XML is a very compelling solution when you have, I think, limited amounts of data or you would like simply to implement a config file that you want to be able to edit with Pico. Or Nano or Emacs or Vim, and you don't need an actual database to do so. And so that's exactly what Project One will be all about. So, with that said, let's take a look at the lectures page. So, in our lecture subdirectory, we have, just like we have for the home page, a fairly well, it looks scarier than it should be at this font size, frankly, but we have some PHP code. That goes about processing that file. And rather than go through this, which is going to look more overwhelming than it needs to, we'll do a little something from scratch、uh, that will allow us to generate similarly dynamically a page like that. But first, a few notes. So here's a representative XML、uh, element. So XML, if you've never seen it before, is pretty much like XHTML, except the tags that exist are completely up to you. There's no fixed set of tags like H1 and body that you have to adhere to. You can come up with your own. And there do exist、uh, languages like XML schema and something called DTD that allow you to define what your XML has to look like if you actually need to、uh, claim this is consistent, this is valid with respect to a spec. We're not going to worry about that, certainly in this course. And you typically wouldn't if you're only using the XML data for your own purposes and need not interact with others or other systems. So here is a snippet of XML that is perhaps best described on a high level as representing what? Yes,、yeah, so、a book. So, some kind of order, right? Like a, a purchase order, something from Amazon. So, you can think of perhaps different scenarios in which storing the data might, like this might be helpful. In fact, Amazon itself has a lot of third party、um, vendors these days. So, you can buy a Harry Potter book not from Amazon, but from one of these third parties, but through Amazon. And presumably, Amazon's got to communicate that information from themselves over to that third party client. And one language, one、uh, standard in which they might do so is just Just by sending some XML data across the wire rather than, say, transferring a whole SQL database or just sending an email, right? Because this is clearly structured, and anything structured lends itself to machine processing or parsing. And that's ultimately what PHP is going to be able to do with a file like this. So, a few pieces of jargon, some of it obvious. So, anytime you have an open tag, that represents the start of an element, and the end tag closes that element. So, that's a、uh, piece of jargon familiar from XHTML. Attributes you're familiar with,、um, certainly. Some of these things are pretty intuitive. A child element or descendants, ancestors, any of these kinds of family tree terms would be commonly used in the context of something like this. And then you have just text elements. So, for instance, David and Malin and 2005 0621, which I think literally was the day I ordered this book from Amazon,、um, and the price. These are all text elements. They're not metadata. Their actual data. And that's what the tags, though, are. And that's where, wherein lies the utility of something like XML. It allows you to associate metadata with data that's useful. Why? You can come up with a few reasons, probably. Why is this metadata, the stuff between tags, worth including in the file? Because clearly it bloats the file. So, it's self descriptive, right? You don't need a specification. You don't need to be told in advance what this file is going to look like because you can parse the file top to bottom, left to right, and figure out exactly what, the, what these pieces of data actually mean by way of the tag that comes before it and by way of the tag that comes after it. So, it's a lot more dynamic in that sense. It's extensible, too, because if we decide later on to include not just a first name and last name, As it relates to a person, but we decide to start storing middle name and phone number. Well, we can start adding those elements hierarchically to this document and assuming the person who's processing this document hasn't made certain foolish assumptions like first name always comes second and last name always comes first, but rather just exists somewhere in the document. You can change the file format by adding new content to it, presumably without breaking existing implementations. And that too is, is compelling because it's sort of inherently. Backwards compatible, so long as you don't completely overhaul the file's format. Well, what does that mean in more,、uh, in more 
specific terms. Here's an example of having extended this same exact file with a notion of an address element, which has a street, a number, a city, a state, an initial element as opposed to a middle name. But the rest of the file is the same, which again means that the program, whether it's your code or someone else's, that was designed originally to process this file probably will not choke when it's now fed this file. But if it wants, it can make use of this additional information. So therein lies the extensibility of XML. So let's do something that's a little more concrete here. So here is a representative document, uh, a little more um, relatable to the course. So here is a database of sorts. It's just a text file containing some XML content, a uh, database for students. All right, so the first line of code up there, which you've actually probably seen in other co contexts, is what? This very first line of code. Whoops, very first line of code here. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, so it's an XML declaration. What does that mean? Yeah, that's, that's actually how I would put it. So, hi, I am an XML document. A few stupid gotchas. If you have an XML declaration at the top of your file, it has to be at the very top to the very left. That is, that open caret has to be the very first character in the document because XML processors will actually open the file and look literally at the first 8 bits or first 16 bits to look for this identifier to see it, uh, similar in spirit to a magic number, if you're familiar with that notion from various file formats. If it's there, it just contains useful meta information for the parser saying, here's version 1.0 of XML, and here is the encoding that the file actually contains. But it's not strictly necessary, and we tend to leave it off in our own config files because we know what code is actually going to be processing these things. Um, line after that, softball question. Even. What's that? I, uh, yeah, nine, I always forget the number that comes after. So encoding simply, is, so you're probably familiar with ASCII, like 7-bit ASCII, which maps certain uh, decimal digits to specific characters. That was all fine and good until we needed more than the letters A through Z and 0 through 9 and the punctuation you see on a keyboard. Asian languages in particular need a much broader character set. So there are other encoding techniques that use different patterns of bits to represent different characters. UTF-8, for instance, is um, much more in vogue these days. There's UTF-16, and it simply refers to different standards for representing letters with numbers. But you'll find that UTF-8, UTF-16, all use the same encodings for the most familiar characters like A through Z, so they're really supersets of what we know as ASCII. So, okay. So the second thing in the file, uh, open bracket, bang, hyphen, hyphen, what is that? Comment. So they exist in XHTML, they exist in HTML, they also exist in XML. The program, the parser that, write, uh, that reads this document uh, will actually see it but won't necessarily do anything with it. And then the first element, and this is the one worth noting if you're sort of unfamiliar with this world, just as a web page must have one and only one HTML element as its so-called root element, same goes for XML in general. Everything must be surrounded by one and only one root element. Beneath that, you can have as many children and as many descendants as you would actually like. So there's one other thing worth, uh, two other things perhaps worth noting here. What does this here represent? Perhaps familiar? Yes, yeah, so this is an empty element that has no attributes, clearly, but it also has no textual content. It has no children, no, has no descendants, and that's fine because here it might not be fundamentally useful, but at least it's clear to the program or to the human receiving this file that it's not that we forgot the dorm, it's just that there is maybe no dorm information. Um, and certainly there are contexts like an XHTML where you just want an empty element, the HR tag, the BR tag, and there's a few others still. Another interesting feature here is this thing. So what is a C data section? And this actually you might have seen in the world of XHTML as well. Character yeah, character data. What's that mean though? Exactly. So the parser, upon encountering this crazy sequence of symbols, open bracket, bang, square bracket, C, D, A, T, A, open bracket, means read in everything that follows, but don't try to parse it. Don't even look at the characters, sort of just gobble up these letters blindly until you see close bracket, close bracket, close bracket, at which point you return that whole block of text as the value that you have read in. And this is useful, it seems, for what kinds of reasons, at least in XML? Yeah, so you can embed HTML or XHTML that 
might otherwise confuse the parser because here's another open bracket, here's some more closed brackets, but they really don't belong to the XML document. Moreover, if you want to include really messy HTML that might not have a close element, a close tag associated with an open tag, well then the whole parser is going to choke because an XML parser does require that the document be, uh, to borrow a term from earlier in the semester, well formed, which just means that when you open a tag, you've got to close it. When you open quotes, you've got to close them. Um, if you had an HR tag or a BR tag in there that itself was not closed or an empty element, well, the whole file would um, create problems for whatever program is reading this. So you can escape content in that way. And we actually do this as well in some of the course's config files um, for very similar reasons to generate the software page. So that presents some of the basic uh, features. Um, Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, ISO 8859-1 is one that you might have seen at the top of the file. Um, what I think we'll do with some of this content is the following. Let's go through it a little quickly, only because I think it's good to know or at least uh, have seen once. Um, but I think spending too much long on some of these details will very quickly get tedious. So we'll dive in shortly uh, to an actual example with this stuff. OK, so the root element, this is all fairly self-explanatory. Let's not spend much time on this at all. But if you need a reference as to what might demark the start of an element, there are certain conventions like what letters may be allowed as the first element. Somewhat annoyingly note is that you may not begin an element's name with a number, which is something you might otherwise trip over. Question. Ooh, OK, so we, we already jumped to juicy questions. So uh, when should something be an attribute? When should something be a child element? So this is actually a really good question, and it relates precisely to a project like Project 1, where one of the goals will be to take this three aces pizza menu and decide for yourselves what is the best way to represent this data. What you'll probably find is there is no one best way, no necessarily obvious way, but many different ways. And among the design decisions you'll likely trip over is, do I make this thing an attribute? Do I make this thing a child element? Well, let's try to answer that by way of a uh, concrete example here. So here's that student element. Uh, this was one way to implement this thing. But let's take a look at the ID attribute. So ID, I clearly made an attribute of a student. Could I have made it a child element? Yeah, I mean, if I made it a child element, what would I probably call that element? What would its start tag and end tag be called? Probably just ID, right? There, that's sufficient metadata to figure out what it is. So why did I make it an attribute? Or was no thought at all given to this? Yeah? Exactly one. So exactly one. So if you have an attribute, it seems like as soon as you introduce an attribute, you forego the notion of hierarchy and structure. Because it doesn't look like it'd be appropriate to start putting more open brackets and closed brackets and indentation between pairs of quotes. And that's precisely right. You simply uh, put simply one value in between those quotes. Another comment from back? Yeah, so there are more advanced reasons as well, if you will, whereby when you want to get at the data later, you will very often find it easier or quicker to get at attributes than to actual get, actually get at child elements. And we may very well see this in a, a, some samples of XPath code in PHP later tonight. But I would say the biggest and sort of most compelling one is, um, well, one of the most compelling ones is if you don't need, if there's no possible notion of extending this piece of information further, it typically makes sense to just put it there as an attribute. A caveat there, though, I would say, is if you want to, for instance, have a descriptive string that's not numeric, but something that might be long, a sentence, a paragraph, frankly, it just starts to look messy if you put it in an attribute. So a reasonably compelling, uh, a reasonably compelling um, motivation for making it a child element is just it looks a little cleaner in the file as well. So that might, too, be a, a decent uh, explanation. So well, I think we'll see more of this, and you'll certainly experience more of this in the actual problem set. Um, so along these lines, and just to formalize what you can do with these files, so know that an element can have, according to XML spec, four different content models. And these are all described here by way of example. So the first is one, uh, what you'd call element content. So you have an element called student, and it can have uh, children that themselves are elements. Well, that means that element has element 
content. Really not all that hard. Um, the second one, parsed character data, aka PC data. So this is where XML becomes useful when you're actually tagging with metadata actual data. So if you have an element like name with Jim Bob as the name in between a start tag and a uh, close tag, well, that's just PC data. In contrast with C data, which we said a moment ago is not actually parsed. So this will have some interesting implications as to what characters are actually allowed or disallowed inside of PC data. Mixed content just means that you can commingle elements and text. Um, this is a perhaps arbitrary way of taking advantage of this uh, particular content model. It's a little weird to say that someone's name is Jim Bob with a middle initial of J and to semantically tag the middle initial right in the middle of that phrase, but it's doable. And we've, you'll certainly see in the world of XHTML, which itself is XML, hence the X, where you do commingle elements like this. You might have a paragraph of text or div containing some paragraph of text. And inside of that, certainly, you might have some anchor tags and some close tags. You might have some bulk and bold and close bold tags. So you'll certainly commingle uh, text and, um, and element content in contexts like that. And then finally, you have no content when you have an empty element. Now, elements themselves, and here comes some of the gotchas. Um, one, have to be named sort of reasonably. And you can look to the specific definition there. But if they pretty much are words, English words, you're just fine. But there are a few caveats there and a few other pieces of punctuation that are allowed. The value itself um, must, uh, whoa, something happened here. The slide is called elements. But the value, huh, interesting, uh, must be quoted. OK, I don't know how I did that, but I somehow commingled my discussion of elements with attributes. So the name here is accurate. Inter this is not about attributes. Let's, sorry about that. Let's rewrite history. OK. Yeah, OK, fix, never happened. <laughs> Edit the past 10 seconds out. So when we're talking about attributes, OK, attributes are similarly named to elements. So they have to be renamed reasonably, that being the specific uh, specification. Um, and they must be quoted. So we've said this before in the context of XHTML. But XML itself requires that attributes values be quoted with double quotes or single quotes. You can commingle them so long as you are consistent as to which ones are the outermost and which ones are the innermost. So these are two accurate examples. But the gotcha is that they they cannot contain open bracket or ampersand, because those pieces of data have special meaning to XML and in turn to an XML parser, the program that reads this file. And put casually, if you have a token like open bracket or an ampersand inside of closed uh, a pair of quotes, the parser is going to choke. And something bad will happen. You'll get some kind of error. So that begs the question, how do you avoid such problems? Yeah, so there's this notion called entities, which you've probably seen some. So more on those in just a moment. So just to reiterate what we just said, um, attributes have these three characteristics as well. I'll go back and fix that online. So entities are the solution to precisely this problem. So there's a, a, at least one entity you're probably familiar with if you've made web pages before. Uh, ampersand NBSP semicolon is an entity that denotes a non-breaking space. Well, that just represents a special character that there really is no character on. Uh, there's no key on a keyboard for. And so it's represented with this entity code. Um, there are five predefined entities in XML that address such problems as we just saw before. One of them is, uh, and this is when you get into this weird, uh, weird sort of circular loop. If you want to have an ampersand as the value inside of a, an attribute, you can't just put ampersand. It has to be ampersand AMP semicolon. Um, if you want to have the less than sign, open bracket, it's ampersand LT semicolon. Um, and there do exist others as well that are useful, like GT for greater than, APOS for apostrophes, and quote for actual quotes. So if you really want to commingle quotes together, you can do it reliably with these actual entities. And there are also numeric equivalents. So you'll find that if you want to have things like an N dash or an M dash in your web page, there are often nicknames for these things that the browsers do support. But you're much uh, safer in using the numeric codes. And where do you find these numeric codes? Well, frankly, this is one of those things where Google is your friend. HTML entities will bring up a whole bunch of options. And here, for instance, 
instance is a bunch of popular ones at this particular site. And you'll see that through all of these funky looking numeric codes, ampersand, sharp sign, number, semicolon, you will get a very specific character that you might not otherwise find on the keyboard. But that allows us to avoid certain problems, to be clear, in XML. Uh, OK, C data section, talked about that a moment ago. Comments are pretty boring. All right, so let's actually do something with this information. So let me go ahead and pull up a uh, putty window here. I'm going to go into today's source directory, and I'll leave these files around after tonight for reference. Let's go about representing something. Um, how about, OK, it was the Oscars last night. So let's see how many of these we can remember. So let me start creating a movie call, a file called movies.xml. Uh, propose a name for the root element of this file, the goal being to represent a database of movies. OK, so we could do Oscar. OK, we could call, what I hear? Oscar movies? Movie. I'm going to go with movies just because I'm a little anal and I like to have my root element the same name as the file name. But frankly, it's, it's arbitrary. All right, so we've got that. I'm going to close it immediately. And now we're on our way. Let me pull it down on the screen a little bit. All right, propose something reasonable for the child element of this thing. All right, so what's that? OK, so that's pretty reasonable. Movie, now we have some design decisions. And there's certainly no one right answer here. We need to decide what are we going to store with respect to each of these movie elements. Well, what's an obvious one? All right, so, OK, I heard several answers. <laughs> Maybe this interactive thing doesn't work very well. But so name, so let me go ahead and leave that placeholder there. What else? OK, oh, God, all right. If I'm going to challenge my, how closely I paid attention last night. All right, director, genre, OK, that I'm a little better at. Actors, OK, so that's going to make for some interesting stuff. Let me omit that all together, because then you start getting into questions. What if uh, Kate Winslet's in all these movies this year? Do we just redundantly put her name again and again? So it's a good one, but let's, let's wait on that. Give me uh, one other. An ID. OK, so that's not bad. So let's do that. An ID equals something. So this is a database, and it's probably going to prove useful if we somehow uniquely identify these movies, especially if over time there are movies with identical names, which certainly happens with remakes and such things like as that. All right, so let me make a few copies of this so we have a couple placeholders. Three movies. I'm going to arbitrarily give this the ID number of one, this the ID number of two, and this last one the ID number of three. Uh, let's go ahead and in no particular order, slum dog millionaire. Uh, see now, okay, so genre. <laughs> see, design decision. <laughs> it's an iterative process. Okay, drama, I think that's a reasonable category there. What's another of the five movies nominated last night? Uh, Batman. Batman wasn't best picture though. Oh, it was milk, okay. So genre, another drama. drama. OK. And give me one more. Curi OK. Curious case of Benjamin Button. Out of all the movies on display last night, I did see Dark Knight, um, but I only saw Slumdog Millionaire. But it turns out that was OK, since uh, it's apparently a pretty good movie. Uh, this one, drama. There's a theme here. OK, so that'll do it for us for now. So we've got an XML database of movies. Certainly, we could have more in here. Few softball questions. Is it well formed? Yeah. Oh, did I, was that a yes or no? Anyone say no? What's that? No. Oh, OK. So, all right, so there's some non-committal no's over here. So there's no XML de declaration. The declaration, though, is optional. So the parser will infer what the uh, encoding is by just going to its default, say U2F8 or ASCII if it's not there. So it's not strictly required. So that's OK. So it doesn't say it's an XML file, so the parser is going to have to just assume. So some program or some function is going to be past this file or the name of this file. And certainly, a program could just decide arbitrarily, if there is no XML declaration, I'm not going to touch this file. But according to the XML spec, the declaration is by nature um, optional. And so it really should do a best effort to start parsing this as XML and only throw an error if it just completely gets tripped up by feeding it something that's not even close to XML. Anyone else? Could use some comments. Could use some comments, but doesn't need them strictly. So not a problem of well-formedness. <laughs> Is this document well-formed? 
OK, it is. It is. So you keep proposing ideas, and I'll continue to shoot them all down. So I'm pretty sure it's well formed. And all that means it's, it's syntactically valid, right? Open tags are closed, uh, open quotes are closed, um, and your names are consistent. And incidentally, even though my example earlier with the purchase order had all capital letters for element names, um, there's no requirement. But it, XML is case sensitive. So even though the folks at the W3C have decided that XHTML must have tags that are lowercase, so no more of these uppercase HTML tags, when it comes to your own XML files, it's entirely up to you. Personally, I tend to use lowercase, but there's no, uh, no rule there. OK, so now let's actually do something with this information. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the white space, although it's not strictly necessary, because much, much, if not all, all of the superfluous white space in an XML file will be automatically discarded by the parser. Now, that's not necessarily true, but at least in PHP, all of that kind of white space, all this indentation is fundamentally meaningless. It will get, in fact, get thrown away when this file is processed. So now let's actually do something with this file. And I'm going to make it um, uh, 644 so that we can actually view it in a browser. And I'm going to go ahead and open this. Let's take a look at how Firefox renders this same file. I'm going to go into our screen-friendly source code, movies.xml. And what you'll see is that Firefox and IE, this is not strictly what my file looks like, because my file certainly does not have this built-in ability to collapse things and such. So this is simply Firefox's stylization of that data. In short, there's some kind of style sheet, CSS-like style sheet, that's telling the browser to render tag names in purple, attribute names in bold black, uh, attributes values in blue, and so on. It's just a browser. Thing. But if we actually right click and view source, we'll see the actual file without all of that uh, fanciness. So now let's do something with this. I want to actually make a web page that has some actual content. I'm going to go ahead and just grab, since again, I never actually remember uh, what the headers look like. I'm going to go ahead and grab a template from last time, google.html, and I'm going to call it, um, let's say, my movies.php file today. I'm going to open up movies.php. And really, I'm just going to rip out all of the stuff that we had last time. Just because now I have an XHTML uh, XML demo. I now have a well-formed and also valid XHTML page because I have all that stuff at the top, like the doc type declaration and so forth. So now let's actually do something with this. I did change the extension to PHP, but all that means now if I go over here and open up movies.php, I do have XML demo in the top left-hand corner, but certainly there's no content. So somehow I want to go about and open this file and actually do something with the information. So it turns out that PHP comes with, again, the proverbial kitchen sink. So I'm going to go ahead and Google simple XML which is the name of the API that now comes with recent versions of PHP that has a whole bunch of built-in capabilities when it comes to XML processing. So you can certainly play around with the documentation here, but you'll find that there's many more functions than you really need to know about in order to start using uh, XML uh, in PHP quickly. So what, in fact, I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to go ahead and just inside my body tag, I'm, I'm just playing around right now, so I'm not going to worry too much about where I'm putting the code. I'm not going to worry about commingling PHP and XHTML just yet. I'm going to go ahead and do the following. Declare a variable called XML. I'm going to declare a new simple XML element. Uh, yep, it's new simple XML element. And simple XML elements constructor, if you're familiar, uh, with the notion of object-oriented programming. And if not, that's fine. You can infer as we go. Apparently takes as its first argument a well-formed XML string or the path or URL to an XML document if uh, data is URL is true. All right, so let me focus on the first, because I'm getting, I don't really know what this means, data is URL is true, a well-formed XML string. Now, unfortunately, I have a well-formed XML file not a string, but again, thanks to PHP, we have a whole bunch of built-in functionality. Let me go ahead and go to a, a function called uh, file get contents. Fortunately, some of PHP's functions are very descriptively but very verbosely named. And this is a really useful function. So gone are the days in this language when you have to strict, uh, strictly call fopen and then fread and then iteratively call the same and then finally call fclose. There's a lot of convenience uh, functions like file get contents whereby you pass it the path or the name of a file locally 
or even a URL, neatly enough, it goes and grabs that file or grabs that web page and returns the whole thing, however big it is, as one big string. So I'm going to go ahead and use that here because it gets the file very quickly for me into memory. I'm going to call this function immediately, and the file is again called movies.xml, and that should do it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save, and now. I'm kind of curious what's inside this thing. So remember that a, a useful debugging trick, uh, at least when you're learning initially, is to just print recursively these kinds of variables, just so I can see this a little cleanly. I'm going to just temporarily, and again, these are just little debugging hacks, I'm going to put in a preformatted tag so I see this hierarchical structure of this file. So now let's go back to movies.php again. OK. So this function, this pair of function calls, seems to have done something interesting, reading into memory some kind of data structure. But because we can read the documentation and not try to figure out by inference how this thing's actually working, we can actually avoid a lot of these underlying implementation details, because you don't even need to know that much. In fact, if my goal now is to simply print out an unordered list of all of these Oscar movies, iteratively I'm going to want to spit out what kind of XHTML element? Sorry? Uh, so an li, so a list item element. So I just want to iteratively spit out these things. So that means I'm probably going to say something like print uh, open bracket li, and then I don't know, something. I'll just leave up, well, let's not confuse syntax with, uh, we'll just do literally something. And then finally, I'm going to close li. OK. So let's see what's going to happen here. All right, so movies.php. OK, so I'm kind of on the right track, but certainly not doing anything useful yet. So I probably want to iterate over these things. And here's the syntax. It's actually pretty simple. So for each uh, XML, now I need to remember what my schema is, what the design is of this file. So let me go back to that for just a moment, movies.xml. OK, so I have a whole bunch of movie elements, and I want to iterate over those elements. Well, what the simple XML API does for me is the following. It reads into this XML variable the entire file, starting with the root element. So think of this variable now as containing the root element, and much like a, a tree in a data structures class, every descendant of that root element beneath it. And all of the names are preserved of those elements. So if I want to iterate over all of the movie children of the root element, and this is effectively the root element, all I need to do is say this as movie. So if you've not come across this in some of our examples before or in any of the online references or books in the course, just know that this is a typical for each construct. And a for each construct takes uh, the following syntax. In parentheses, you specify the name of an array. And then you write the word as. And then the word after that is simply the temporary variable that you want to assign iteratively to each element in that array. So it turns out that XML arrow movie returns to me an array. And inside of that array, if you're following along, what is, uh, is what? Yeah, so all of the, the children, all of the movie elements specifically. So what this means is we're going to have a loop that probably goes around three times each time dollar sign movie takes on the value of the ith movie element in the file. Now that movie element in turn has some structure recall. So that movie element has a, a name child and a genre child, and actually it has an ID number as well. So there's some interesting pieces of data we can get at. Let's try to get at one of the simplest first. I'm now going to change something to the ID number. And let's see if I at least spit out an unordered list of ID numbers and then take things one step further. So movie, how do you get at the ID attribute? Well, the syntax using this API is simply to treat the movie variable as an array and to use uh, bracket quote unquote the name of the attribute. And if all goes well, that's all it takes to get at the attribute. And to your point earlier, one of the design decisions that might motivate using attributes over children is one, it's just so darn easy to get at the data. And that itself might be reason alone. So let's take a, uh, go ahead and save, reload, and OK. Interesting. So we've kind of re-implemented an ordered list with an unordered list here, but that's OK. Let's now do something with the movie titles. It's a little different. Yeah. No. So if I'm using the, uh, the square brackets on the dollar sign movie variable, all I'm going to get is a, a, uh, an attribute called quote unquote something associated with that specific element. So we're going to have to dive in deeper if we want to get at a child. But to get at a child is pretty darn easy. I want to get at the name. 
Well, you just kind of follow the arrows, much like you would draw a tree on paper. We're just going to follow the arrows down to the next child. So a movie only has one name, so this should actually do the trick. Let's go ahead and reload, and voila. Now I have all of the movie elements here. Uh, the names of these movies printed out. If I want to parenthetically add something like the genre, okay, well, we can do something like dot, and this is just going to be a little ugly for a moment with some aesthetics, but dot uh, movie genre, and then I'll just move this over here, close parenthesis, and now I reload, and now we have this data as well. So now what if we decide later on to go back to this movies.xml file and change things such that, um, Maybe I decide, you know what, um, hmm. let's see if I can come up with, what's that? Okay, so yeah, let's see, yeah, we could do something like that. So we could have something like awards, and if I actually remembered the 12 awards that they won last night, we could do something like award, and then we could say like best picture. And then I can do close award. Right, so this isn't bad. Give me one other if you were paying closer attention than I. OK. Original score. OK. So we'll stop it. We'll stop at two. So now they have two awards. Is the document still well formed? OK, it is. It's been extended, hence the extensibility feature of XML. And even though you've barely seen, presumably, this simple XML API, have we broken my own code? No, right, because I've made no assumptions as to the presence of other data. I've no, made no assumptions really as to the location of this data other than the actual hierarchy. So the mere addition of this data, which might very well happen in the real world if your data provider decides, you know what, here's yet more information than you might need, your code's not going to break, at least if you've designed it as we have here. So now let me go back to this file here. I'm going to get rid of genre just because it's making the code a little ugly. So the current version of my code now is just to say titles. And now underneath each of these movies, I want to do something like it list out yet more hierarchically all of the um, awards that these guys have won. Well, let me just change the XHTML a little bit so we can have a bit of hierarchy here. Uh, let me take this here, close this element, and get rid of this. And now just to do a little sanity check, I'm just going to do a print here. And again, infinite number of ways we could do this. But I just wanted to restructure my code so I can fit this in a little more cleanly. Now what I want to do is, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and print the movie name. But then, let's see, I want to go ahead and uh, print below that another, let's do an ordered list this time, just to make clear the distinction. All right, let's close this immediately. And inside of this, I'm probably going to have another what construct? No, uh, uh, bra oh, yes, thank you, thank you. That was not well formed. All right, there we go. OK, so now we need so another for each, right? Let's see, so what, what's the array in question right now? Or, what, or what's the, uh, the element in question? Yeah, so awards. So I'm at the current movie element. Let's hope I can get to the awards element. And let me dive in a little further, because before, when I wanted to iterate over the movie elements, I did this in the singular. So even though it's a little further nested, I'm just going to follow the arrows. So the current movie down to its awards, down to its award. And because of how the API is implemented, this chunk of code is going to return to me, I hope, an array of actual award elements. And now I'm going to call each of these arbitrarily award. And now inside of here, I'm just going to print out another what? Link uh, list item. And then I'm going to print out the award. Yeah, so it's just the award's name. It's just got a text value. So hopefully that'll work. Close list item. Any worries? Oh, so really good segue. Let me postpone answering that. But the question is, is there a better way? Because you can certainly imagine for large, very nested files, this just gets a little sloppy, a little overwhelming, having all this huge chain. Short answer, yes. There are other ways to get at the same data, which we'll see in just a moment. All right, so let's see what the effect is here. Let me go ahead and reload. Ooh, that does not look good. All right, so what's the problem? So incidentally, this is not the default output of PHP. We've installed uh, a, a library called xdebug on the course's server. I think we have this linked on the software page. This uh, gives you trace dumps instead of just PHP's default error messages. And we do this really for pedagogical purposes. These error messages in orange are more descriptive than the default PHP error messages. And you can certainly add them to your own server remotely. 
but what this is telling us a little more descriptively usually is where the errors happen. So it looks like, OK, there's a problem. It's OK, sometimes it's not that helpful. Uh, Location. Oh, there it is. So the font's a little small, but notice in orange uh, there's a problem in movies.php on line 22. So you'd see that, um, and if we had a whole bunch, a whole bunch of function calls on the stack, that is, we called a whole bunch of functions in. Uh, uh, in turn, we would see them all in this tab table format. But what's summarize it? Even if you're not, you don't really care about the specifics there. Certainly not how long it took for me to generate this error. What's the problem? So it doesn't. Sorry. Right. So I have no awards. So this is kind of problematic because I don't want to give the other movies any awards, at least for our purposes here. So there's hopefully a few solutions. Any come to mind? Yeah, OK. Uh, one, in, one solution at a time. How about here? So we should at least check if this element exists, or in fact, if we're getting back an array. Because this problem seems to be what? Invalid arguments applied for for each. Well, there's only really one discretionary argument. That's this first one, or one necessary argument. That's this first one that is expecting, uh, that's expected to be an array. So clearly, it's not returning an array here. So how could we do this? Well, to be honest, there's a bunch of different ways. We could do something like if is array. And then we could actually do something like this. Let me just copy this code, paste it in here. We could take this approach here, because now this for each will only get executed if what the API is returning to me is an actual an array. So let's see if this solves my problem. OK, it does. Are there other ways we could do this still? Well, there is one approach. I'm just going to go to the top of the file here. Well, actually, let me go to my, the top of my PHP chunk. Um, you can do the following. Notice that the error I had a moment ago was this. So it's a warning. Well, there are ways around this. So there is this function called uh, error reporting uh, in PHP. Actually, let me show you the other one first. There is this one, any set. The variable is called display errors. And if we've not overridden this in our config, if I change that to be false, bye bye. <laughs> So no more error. But if we have uh, file-based logging enabled, it's still going to be there. And technically, it's still an error, because you're kind of abusing the language. But the language is not, or the, part, the PHP processor at least lets you hide some of these things. But I would say not in your best interests. The other solution you did a minute ago, it flashed pretty quick, so I'm not completely sure. But it looked like you lost the two um, underneath the slum million error. It looked like those disappeared as well. Yeah, it's the other way. Oh, I know. OK, I see what you're saying. Oh, yes. So when I, OK, yes, I retract fully what I just said. So the simple XML API is actually doing some trickery whereby it's not technic it's not really returning an array in that particular sense. There's some really neat functions built into PHP that allow you to use syntactic sugar like this, the arrows and the chaining. Um, but there's some interesting stuff going on underneath the hood. So let me retract that completely. Um, Thank you. I almost got away with that. Um, let me just show you a couple other approaches to this. Um, one, you can turn off errors. Not necessarily a good solution, but there are different types of errors in PHP. And this is worth knowing. There's this thing called a notice, which is really just an FYI. You might want to know this, but isn't strictly an error or even worthy of a warning. There are warnings, which means your code's not going to die, but you probably should fix this in errors quote unquote, are actual errors that interfere with PHP actually spitting out your results. So you can actually change what's called the reporting level. And this is typically done by first saying, give me all errors, and then XOR out uh, e warnings, uh, e warning. And if I really want to get rid of the annoying ones like notices, um, you can do this as well. So this too would get rid, come on of that, uh, that message as well. But it's not actually fixing the problem. Another way to suppress errors in PHP, as you'll see, um, you can actually do this. You can use the at sign in front of code. If you know in advance that what you're doing might actually trigger some kind of, oh, oh that's for notices. Damn it, strike two. <laughs> OK, I retract that one as well. If you have these things called notices, which we actually turn off on the server because they will cause you to bang your head against the wall um, early on when learning PHP, you can suppress notices by prepending the line with the at sign, which pretty much says, shh, I don't want to know about these things called notices. But we already have those turned off, so I can't quite show you those just yet. Um, so ultimately, we will reveal a solution after the break. Let's take a five minute break.
All right, we're back, and this code now works. So the better way of doing this is simply checking as with a simple if condition, if the following property is actually going to come back to me, go ahead and do this actual for each construct. And so in fact, let's take this same example and do something a little similar, but let's add a bit of conditionality to the display of some information of uh, the movies themselves. So I'm going to take some liberties here and say, you know what, eh, Slumdog Millionaire is kind of a romance. I kind of need a different category here. So now we have two dramas and a romance. All right, so let me go ahead and save that. I'm going to go ahead and copy movies .php to let's say dramas.php. I'm going to open up dramas.php and I'm going to go ahead in here and add some code. I'm, I don't care about the awards anymore because I just want to par this down to something a little simpler. And I instead want to do this. So if the current movies genre, uh, genre happens to equal drama, genre, drama, okay, uh, go ahead and do the following. So go ahead and print that list item. Go ahead and do that, printing the name, and then the closed list item. So if I go back to our directory here, choose dramas.php, now I just have these two files. So the point here is just the ease with which you can get at the data. And the takeaway when it comes time to start implementing project one is that if you're going to have to, for instance, show uh, the current uh, types of, um, let's say, there are different categories of food in this menu. There are salads, spaghetti or ziti, specialty pizzas, side orders, homemade calzones. Um, so there's a whole bunch of categories. And as you'll see when you read through the spec, you're asked not to display the whole menu on one huge overwhelming page, but categorically. So the user can go from one uh, category to another category. And so there's clearly opportunities in PHP to just conditionally check whether you want to return this data or do something altogether different with it. In fact, let's go ahead and make this a little more general and say dramas.php will now be called let's say genres.php. And again, I'll leave all this code online. So in genres.php, let's go ahead and do the following. So if the movie genre equals, you know what? Let's do something like this. The value of get genre, then let's go ahead and print out the movie. So now we have the basic framework, very simple, for a page that's going to conditionally display the data, but this time based on user input, not on some arbitrarily hard-coded value. So let me go and open genres.php. But unfortunately, if I pull this thing up like this, it doesn't work. Right? So the very quick fix, and this is not really a good uh, e-commerce website if the user has to come in here <laughs> and type in their genre. But OK, at least it works. Now let me try typing in, and for those uh, for whom the text is a little small, that's all I did. Question mark, genre equals drama, right? So useful, the stuff we talked about in our PHP discussion. Uh, let's change this now to romance, and now I have this. OK, so now let's take things a little further. Maybe let's do um, uh, maybe like a drop down. What if I add to this thing a form that allows me to get at this information? Well, let's start simple. So let me just make a copy of this xhtml so I don't have to retype it all. Uh, and we'll call this home.php because this is where the user might start off uh, initially. I'm going to still parse the same XML file. I'm going to iterate over the genres. But you know what? Instead of printing out just an ordered list, let's print out a form whose destination is going to be genres.php. The method is going to be get. And then inside of this thing, I'm going to need to spit out not list items this time, but what? Yeah, so let's print out in option element. Now an option needs a value. Here's where the, the single quotes, double quotes gets a little useful. All right, what's the value actually going to be? All right, well, something. Let me just get the placeholders in place. Uh, then I'm going to have the actual name of the thing. So dot, uh, let's say, whoops. Let's get rid of that. So the current movie's genre. And then I'm going to have to close this option. So this will, let's see, will that print out the options that I want? Get rid of this here. What am I missing? Yeah, so I kind of forgot the select element, so let's do that. So select, name of this thing is going to be genre. Now down here, I've got to go ahead and close select. And when we say in the specs, we expect your PHP code to be pretty printed, um, this is the general idea of what we mean. Um, there are certain certainly some style decisions you can make as to what pieces of code you indent, but this is the general idea. Go with whatever is uh, stylistically preferable to you, um, even though I'm wrapping at this font size now. Will this print out a select menu? It's not perfect yet, but will it give me the select menu? Let's see. Let's go into my directory here. It's called home.php. It's not a pretty web page yet, but at least, oh, oh, okay. So 
Uh, there's clearly some opportunities for improvement, but we'll, we'll worry about that later. I do want to go ahead and put in a submit button. So input type equals select. Oh, that was the whole point of this, wasn't it? OK, input type equals uh, submit, value equals search, let's say. All right, so now it's getting a little more fake Google-like. Uh, what else do I want to do here? Well, you know, if you've never done this, option, value, it's kind of nice just to do this sometimes, just so that you don't default to something. All right, this is kind of still a problem. Uh, I'm not sure how to fix this just yet, so we're going to leave this alone. Um, okay, now we have to go in and put these values. So this is where PHP can very quickly get messy, right? It's already a little messy in that we're just sort of commingling my logic and we're printing out XHTML. But as a starting point, this is all pretty reasonable, I think. It keeps things simple and straightforward. So I could do this. So let's print out as the value of this attribute, genre, but it's getting a little complicated, right? So there's a lot of close quotes and open quotes, but hopefully this is at least correct. And in fact, it is. It's still working. Um, let's go ahead now and do one step better. This is kind of messy. Well, it turns out you can use these things here. So movie genre, if I want to embed um, right inside of a quoted string, Let's see, that works too. So you'll find there's some, again, syntactic sugar in PHP that just makes things a little cleaner. And this is one of them. Inside of a uh, quoted string, if I just put a variable in this arrow sign, a lot of it would get confused as a literal arrow sign and then the word genre. But putting it inside of the uh, curly braces tells PHP, treat this as something that needs to be interpolated, something that needs to be converted into its actual value. OK, so now we've got a working form, albeit with some redundancy. Let me go ahead and test it out. So let's search for all of the romances. I'm going to go ahead and click Search. OK, so it actually seems to now work. And if you think back to last week, we could actually now merge home.php and genres.php into the same file by moving some of that logic to the top of one of the files and then doing some kind of conditional check like we did two weeks ago if the get variable actually ex uh, has the genre attribute go ahead and show the list of movies else display the form so you can think of different ways of doing this but we've seen now the building blocks last week in this so a question though came up earlier about how you can get at this data in other ways. So if we want to avoid all of the arrow notation, can we just dive in directly into a file and get out pieces of data, especially for something like this? Well, we can. Let me go ahead and do the following. I'm going to make a copy now of genres.php. And again, keeping our examples nice and simple, I'm going to make a file called xpath.php. So it turns out that in the world of XML, there is, I'm going to skip ahead, do things in a little different order. There is this a query language called XPath. So you might be generally familiar with SQL as well already, um, SQL being uh, a language with which you can query data from a relational database. Well, XPath is kind of similar in spirit in that it's a language that allows you to query data from an XML database or, more generally, an XML file, such as ours here. So it does so by way of these things called location pads, which on first glance look a little ugly, look a little scary. But it's very similar in spirit to a simple file system path with backslashes or forward slashes or a URL, where you dive in deeper, deeper, deeper to a machine's hard drive just by separating the directory names by slashes. Well, as this, as this overall structure kind of depicts, we're going to use slashes again, and it's going to allow us to dive in deeper and deeper and deeper by way of something that looks like a file system or a URL path. So ignore the canonical structure for now, but we'll see that this is, is representative of what we're about to do. I'm going to go into this copy called xpath.php, and I'm going to get rid of this whole loop for just a moment, and I'm just going to say, give me the parsed structure in memory. Well, let's first start with a question. What has this been doing all along? So this is opening the file by way of file get contents. It's then reading all of those bytes, however many there are, into one big string. So maybe we're using a lot of RAM right now, but so be it. And then I'm passing that string to the constructor, the default function for this class called simple XML element, and it's doing something. What is that something? Well, it's doing something such that what's returned is some representation of that XML document. And as we've seen, what it's kind of returning is some kind of tree, some kind of tree structure where there's a root node and then a whole bunch of descendants off of it, much like a family tree. All right, so what is really underneath the hood? Well, we've, you've probably heard this term before. If you've come from the world of JavaScript, you've played in this world before. Well, there's this thing called 
DOM, the Document Object Model. So this, come, this appears actually throughout the course. We'll see it again in JavaScript in the context of doing AJAX. Um, we're seeing it right now in the context of XML. Document Object Model, it's a way of representing hierarchical data as though it's a tree. Because at the end of the day, that's really what the data is. Just as we have an XML file that has a root element, like the root of a family tree, it's got all that nesting, all that indentation, and that hierarchy, if you kind of conceptually flip the file, uh, it doesn't really work just to rotate it, I suppose, but if you kind of flip that uh, hierarchy around, what you really have is a tree structure similar in spirit to this, where the topmost element is the so-called root node uh, here. We'll explain the other one in just a moment. And beneath that are all of its children and their children and similarly attributes. So take a look at the left here. Here's an even slimmer version of our student's XML database, our student's XML file from earlier. And it's got some useful at, um, characteristics. It's got, a XH, it's got an XML comment this time. And it's also got a root element, of course. It's got one child of that root element. But that thing's got a couple of children itself and also an attribute. So we have some pretty good represent, uh, representation of uh, XML here. So on the right-hand side, the tree itself does not, cannot start with the so-called root element. Because as this trivial example suggests, you can actually have stuff outside of the root element. For instance, an XML comment, right? So you have to have something that's higher conceptually than the root element, and that we'll generally call the document or the DOM itself. So that's the root of our DOM, even though the root element is something distinct. But this is a graphical depiction of precisely this file. So let's actually see what's in it. So the document itself is represented by default by just the document node, so to speak. Hanging off of that as, ch as children is a comment followed by an element called students in the plural. And beneath that, if you follow the arrows carefully, are uh, it looks like, actually, that's kind of weird, three children. Well, let's ignore the outermost ones, focus just on this one for a moment. That's an element called student. And that's consistent, certainly, with the XML up here, the one student child there. It, in turn, apparently has five children, which is kind of confusing at the moment, but that's fine. Here's one called name. Here's one called status. And those, in turn, have text nodes. So all of these boxes are what we generally call nodes. There's different types of nodes in a DOM, an element node, a text node, an attribute node, a document node. They're all squares so far as the picture is concerned. And here are their text nodes. So text nodes are typically, uh, text nodes are by nature leaves in the tree. But thanks to empty elements, elements can also be leaves in this tree, in this DOM. Now what's the deal with all the things that I ignored? Uh, why does student have five children? Why does students have three children? Yeah, so, and here's um, a theme that fortunately you get to turn a blind eye to, certainly in the world of JavaScript and AJAX, um, with few if any exceptions, and also in the world of PHP, because there's this notion of ignorable white space in the world of XML. And long story short, it pretty much means that any white space that you, the human, would probably deem uh, ignorable, that is completely superfluous, only useful for aesthetic reasons, similarly with the XML parser or the simple XML API, just ignore it as well. You're not going to see it in the actual tree that comes back. It's just for human readability. But if we wanted to pick this DOM properly, we would in fact include these text nodes, such as the one here. And just to zoom in so that it's clear, inside of these text nodes is backslash n, backslash t. Over here on the right is also backslash n. So that's all that's going on here. Now, there is one thing that's worth noting. This thing has an arrow coming to it from the student element, but it's not going from top to bottom. It's going laterally. Why? Arguably, does this make sense, even though this is really just an artist rendition of what's going on in memory? Why is it kind of misleading to hang it off vertically from the student node? Yeah, so it's not a child, right? And attributes we said earlier are themselves have no extensibility. Like they are either present or they're not. So at least just conceptually kind of makes sense to think of them as hanging off laterally from a node instead of being part of the up-down hierarchy. But again, this is just a representation detail. But it's, it does hint at uh, precisely that constraint. All right, so why is this actually 
Interesting. Well, if we know what the structure of this tree is, if we know what the structure of the XML is, why do we have to sort of iterate over all of the movie elements to then get at all of the dramatic movie elements to then get at all of the awards of those same elements, right? If we already kind of know as the programmer in advance what type of data or what nodes I want from the document, why can't I just dive right in, much like I would on my PC's desktop? Click, 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 just opening folder after folder after folder to get at what I want. You certainly don't sort of look through the entire folder contents and then say, oh, I want this one. Then do the same thing. You typically go right to what you want. And the analog here in the world of XML is that there's this language called XPath that allows you to follow a path, so to speak, right to the data that you care about. So, how can I go about getting, let's say, uh, all of the genres in this file. Well, I can declare a variable called genres, and what I want to do is call the XPath function of this XML variable. So it turns out that this isn't just a variable, it's actually an object, but that makes sense because we call the constructor, and if you're from the world of OOP, you know that objects can have not only data, as we've seen associated with them, but also methods, aka functions. So there's this XPath function that we would have noticed if we looked more closely at the documentation on php.net, and it allows me to specify one argument that is a location path the location to an element in the file. Now the quickest and dirtiest way to get at all of the genre elements in the file is going to be to say slash slash genre. And what this means is go find it for me, casually. So let's see if this actually works. Let me go ahead and, yep, I've just locked my terminal is all. There we go. Okay, let's go ahead and for each, uh, oh, that's wrong, yeah. Case sensitive, there we go. For each uh, genre, uh, for each of these genres, as let's just call it G, just to demonstrate that it is pretty arbitrary, but we'll do something reasonable. What do I want to do? Let's go ahead and, as before, print out a list item, followed by G, followed by list item. So now our code's getting a little cleaner, right? Especially with some of these tricks. All right, let's see if this actually works. This is xpath.php. Let's close this, go back here, xpath.php. And there, okay, so we've got all of the genres. So again, I'm not gonna solve all the problems like, so I almost got some applause there I saw, thank you. Um, we're not, I am gonna sort of leave, I think, as an at-home exercise, the elimination of some of these duplicates, but you can do this in different ways. Like you can hopefully imagine in just some simple conditional code, maybe keeping track with a hash or an array, what you've seen before, you can do it there. But there are also some neat tricks on XPath, which if you read up on some of the predicates that are possible, you'll see how to do some of these things. But I will introduce some of the building blocks here. One, one, let me point out that quick and dirty and amazing as this slash slash genre trick was, it's kind of lazy because you're pretty much wait, saving your developer time, which might be compelling, and telling the parser, literally, go look through the whole damn DOM and find me all of the genre elements. And that's kind of counterproductive because we started this story by saying you know where the data is. So why are you completely failing to tell the parser where the data is and leaving it to him to figure it out. So we can at least be more specific here. We can say something like, well, I know it's in movies, I know it's in movie. Okay, you don't have to go and look through the whole file per se. Now, this is a bit um, sort of misleading because this is such a small file and there's really only movie and genre elements, so really you're looking pretty much at all the same data as well. But just imagine as before, if we had actors in this file, a whole lot of actors, if we had a huge amount of other information, certainly it seems reasonable to, to conclude that the more specific you are, the less work the parser is going to have to do. And for large files, that's certainly the case. So let's see here if we get this same effect, and we do. I've reloaded the page already. and. We're still getting precisely the same effect. What if I only want to do this? You know what? I don't want to iterate over the, the genres. Let's go back to the original idea of iterating over the movie elements. So if I back up here, and let me change my variable names to be movies, and then for each movies as m. So here we're going to print out what in a list? Yeah, so I really want to print out what the name, right? So we'll do, again, sort of uh, draw, tie these lessons together. Okay, so now we're back to the original example. But again, I'm being a little more specific, right? I'm diving into the DOM saying, give me all of the movie elements, and I'm going to iterate over just those, no matter what else is in the file. But I can be more specific. And herein lies some of the real power of XPath. You can filter your result set. So this is a node set that's coming back. You're getting a collection, a linked list of nodes, and hence can you iterate over them with this for each. So you're getting back an array in 
in PHP terms. But you know what? I don't want all of the movies. I only want the movies for which genre equals drama. So notice that I've used square brackets. That denotes a predicate. I've then specified the name of the child whose value I want to check. The equal sign just means equal. And in the single quotes is the value that I want to filter on. So now if I save this file and reload, now I get back only the dramas. So there we have an interesting feature. What if, you know what, let me back up. I don't actually want a genre of drama. I only, for whatever reason, I want the thing with an attribute uh, called ID of 2. Well, at, meaning attribute, at ID equals 2 is hopefully going to give me, yeah, just milk, the second movie that we had in the list. And to be clear why this slide looks so crazy here, there are different things called axes in XPath, which allow you to specify different types of nodes. You can go in different directions, so to speak, in the DOM. By default, the axis that's assumed, if you don't specify one, is what, do you think? It's child. So technically, what I really should have done, if I were really adhering to the spec 100% verbosely, this is really what I've been doing. Take the, child, take the current node. The current node in this case is the root node. Go ahead now and look at all of it. Can't really highlight one character for some reason. Go ahead and look at all of its children called movies. Then take all of those nodes, look at all of their children, and find the ones called movie. So the axis is very specifically saying what types of nodes to check. But typically, you want only child nodes anyway, so it's just assumed. If you have no word followed by a colon, the, parser, uh, the processor for XPath just assumes you want child. But there are other axes. Here we have one. So here I have an at sign. So technically, again, if I wanted to be really verbose with these, respect to this thing, I would say attribute colon. But as you can imagine, typing out all of these long words followed by colons again and again kind of defeats the point of introducing a more convenient query language. So are the, there are these shortcuts. But there are other axes. And in fact, at Extension, I used to teach a whole course on XML. And we'd spend quite a uh, bit of interesting time on various axes. There is a preceding axis, a following axis, a parent axis, a descendant axis, a descendant or self axis. You've actually seen this one. When I was really lazy a moment ago, and when we began this story with this thing, well, when I said this means go search through the whole damn DOM, well, that was sort of the um, crass way of saying search for uh, the uh, descendant, or it is named this, self. Search uh, that. Sorry, I had one colon before. I meant to have two colons. So that's the axis. And slash slash is the shorthand notation for that. But the parent one is useful. And there are neat tricks. If you look at the recommended tutorial in project one for the XPath uh, discussion on W3 schools, you'll see some neat things where if you dive in, for instance, to movies, and then you go into a movie, and then you go into a genre, we could do something like this, where, um, how can I say? Uh, you could do this. If I've dived into movies, movie, genre, and I want to check now that the value of the current element, aka dot, equals drama, and then I realize, oh, damn, I don't want a genre element. I want the movie element with this uh, genre value. You could be a little sloppy and go back up. But we've clearly seen better ways of doing that. Dot, dot denotes parent node. Uh, similarly, could I say, just to overwhelm you with options, parent colon colon star. That would work too. So in short, we're just scratching the surface. But we've hopefully provided in some of these basic examples here certainly enough tricks with which you can go about getting specific data, for instance, specific categorical data like we did for genres of movies that you might want to do for uh, pizza as categories as well. So any questions on XPath? And again, there's some recommended reading in the project for that. Yeah. Ah, good question. So if you want to use XSLT, you actually, so I believe on our server we have the XSLT library installed, um, but it's not, co I mean, yes, you could write XSLT templates and have them evaluated, but you would have to call the appropriate functions that tell PHP, go invoke the XSLT processor, and here's the input that you should use. So yes, you can do it. In this course, we won't touch it. Because um, all we want here, at least for our purposes, is another approach to getting out data without relying on the more traditional ifs and else. Um, we're actually using a nice query language here. So yes, it's doable. And I believe on our servers, if you would like. Actually, actually asking is, like, is, is some of the functionality you can get with XSLT, is there an equivalent 
Oh, the functions. That's a good question. I don't know what fraction of the XSLT and XPath specs PHP has implemented. I would defer to uh, the online documentation. There are a bunch of functions, like you can count the number of nodes returned by a node state. You can capitalize letters, do the equivalent of two upper and two lower using various functions. I don't know how many of those are implemented. So we, at least, even I in PHP have only used it for query purposes, not for uh, data manipulation. No, not at all. The motivation is just one, it's another way to approach the same problem and you'll find that it's a much cleaner approach because effectively implicit in one of the query uh, queries, the location paths I just had was probably four or five lines of PHP code where I would have had to do some ifs and a for each or a for loop to iterate over the data. I can do it in one line of XPath code because it's, it knows how to go find it in the DOM. Yeah. Uh, let's go here and then back. Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. Does this approach fall apart when volume gets huge? Yes. For very large data sets, I would stop using a flat file XML file, instead move to something that actually supports indexing, um, optimizations like a MySQL database or any other actual database engine. Is it behind the scenes go ahead and index things here anyway? No. I, d I don't believe PHP does. It certainly could, but I don't believe it does. Uh, uh, when file get con when the constructor is called, the whole document is uh, parsed. It's read into a, an in-memory representation, a tree of sorts, using references and such, and that stays resident in memory until it's garbage collected when the script terminates. Well, so, uh, so what do you mean by schema, though? Because these documents thus far. To provide the parser with hints. Oh, no. So, so if I am interpreting this correctly, so there are schema languages for XML. One's called DTD, one's called XML schema, which are the formal definitions of what the document needs to look like. Um, you don't need to have schemas because XML itself is self-describing, so the parser in figures out what the structure of the document is by the simple fact that it's well-formed and therefore can be parsed um, hierarchically. So, and the reason that this doesn't work well for large, is not the best approach, at least in PHP for large files, is that this function call, these uh, method calls here are parsing the whole file. And I don't believe PHP has bothered to do what's called lazy parsing, where you just kind of parse the file on demand. What it probably does is it parses the whole file, reads it into one big object in memory, because what this then function does is actually query that DOM pretty much by doing a um, recursive search, a depth first search, that kind of thing on the DOM to find the nodes. Now, I've not looked at the source code for the PHP engine, and you certainly could for the API, but I'm guessing they haven't bothered with those kinds of enhancements. But a lot of Java-based parsers for XML absolutely do some really useful optimizations. Kind of. PHP is not really like Java servlets in that you can have application-wide uh, memory. Um, so even session, in, session information, even though it looks like it's always there available to you, it's being serialized to disk every time the user goes away when the browser closes the connection. So uh, for high-performing code, frankly, I probably wouldn't use PHP in large data structures like this in memory. But again, that's why the problem at hand is, I think, very reasonable. Um, and even we make great use of XML files in the course's website. But if you start talking about, as we will later in the course, scalability, if you're getting thousands of hits per second, you certainly don't want to be reparsing the same XML file again and again. But again, if you've got a dual-core, uh, quad-core machine that's got plenty of spare cycles, certainly the amount of development time you save um, in taking simple approaches is itself, I think, compelling. So again, trade-offs. And we'll move into, in two weeks' time, more sophisticated uh, approaches to the same problem. So why else is this stuff useful? Oh, did you have one other question? Yeah, that was pretty much the answer. I was going to say, why would you want, if this is so easy, why would you want to use XSLT and the scalability 
Scalability, I mean, it's a language preference too. I mean, I would, I, um, XSLT is a really nice template language too. So we'll talk later in the course about um, uh, template libraries for PHP and design of code. We'll talk about a little bit about like MVC, model view controller, when you actually want to really separate uh, metadata, uh, when you really want to separate control structures from your aesthetics. Right now I'm commingling everything, which is fine for these sample applications and certainly for these earliest problem sets, um, but you can certainly imagine factoring out all of the aesthetics and XSLT is a prime candidate for just doing the aesthetic rendering of data. OK, so why else is this useful? So all the rage these days seems to be RSS. There's not any news website out there these days does, that doesn't syndicate itself, it seems, in RSS format. So what does that actually mean? Well, the course's own website has this. If I go to cs75.net and go to the bulletin board, you'll notice that every one of the bulletin boards here has this little RSS icon on it. And if you click on it, you'll get an XML file containing the most recent posts, the most recent five posts to that particular category. So for instance, if I click on uh, Project Zero Setup, I'll see the bulletin board's view of all the activity that's been going on over the past couple of weeks for that project. If I click the RSS feed, I don't actually see XML data. I see what the folks at Mozilla have decided XML feeds should look like in your browser. Right? So they have applied a style sheet of sorts. Might even be as simple as a CSS style sheet or an XSLT style sheet. But if I actually view the source of this page, you see, in fact, XML content. So there's my XML declaration at the top of the line. There is an RSS element. So apparently, according to the RSS, really simple syndication, although it has a bunch of other meanings too because the world never quite decided what the acronym meant. It just had the acronym. Um, there's the version of the language in use. It has a channel inside of it. And inside of a channel is a whole bunch of item elements. So it's a little overwhelming at first to look at a whole file. Um, this URL here coincidentally on Harvard's website at the law school is the official RSS specification, but it pretty much boils down to making an XML file that looks roughly like this. So here is a representative sample that really helps, I think, bootstrap an understanding of what's in it. So an RSS feed has a channel, a uh, news channel typically, and inside of that channel are zero or more item elements, and each item represents a piece of information, a news article, a blog posting, what a, a bulletin board posting. There's some other metadata as well, or some other data as well, a title, description, link, and then inside of an item are some interesting fields. There's a title for the article, a link for the article, or item, a description, maybe a category, a publication date, and then a GUID, which is a unique identifier. So how many of you out of curiosity use RSS readers? OK, so maybe like a quarter of the folks in the class here today. So an RSS reader is just a program that you say, here's the URL of an XML file, an RSS feed, grab me all of the articles every day. So you probably have the ability in your reader to hide articles or to delete them. Well, what your reader's probably doing is it's checking, what is the GUID of this article? What's the unique ID? Let me forever remember that I should never show you that article, uh, the article with that unique ID again. So that's how even your simple reader probably works. Well, why is this useful? Well, suppose I decide, you know what? It'd be kind of nice to help students keep their uh, uh, keep their fingers in the bulletin board a little more easily by putting on the course's homepage a link uh, to the most recent articles about the most recent problem set. Well, using these basic building blocks that we just um, looked at in PHP, can we do exactly that? So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and right click on this RSS feed and just copy the link's location. And again, if I go there, I'm going to see Firefox's rendition of it. But it's really just an XML file, an RSS file coming back. I'm going to go back here to the actual course website and let's go ahead and do this. Let me go into the actual home page. Right? Let me go ahead and take a little BR tags at the bottom. And I'm going to say something like this, recent posts. All right? So I'm going to put uh, then an order, or let's say an unordered list. OK. And then in here, coming, coming soon. All right, so if I've done this correctly and I go to the course's homepage, like anyone else out there, all right, so we're starting to update the course's homepage. Now let's actually get at this information. Well, what do I want to do? You know what? I want to go ahead and do the following. I'm going to copy the same kind of overall structure that I used a little bit ago. All right, so inside of this thing, I want to do what? Let me get an XML variable, and this is going to be the result of new simple XML element calling file get contents of this URL, all right, paste that in. 
All right, and now what do I want to do? Well, for each of the, let's see, XML have items. So each of the items in the file, call it iteratively an item. I want to go ahead and print out, let's say, a uh, link item. And I'm going to keep it simple initially. I'm just going to print out uh, the items what? Do you remember? Sorry? Uh, the items title. Whoops. Items title, close link item. OK, save that. Reload. Hmm. What did I do wrong? Uh, don't need quotations. I think that's OK. Now, a clever teacher would say this was all part of the plan. This is actually a mistake, but we'll use it as a pedagogical learning tool. <laughs> what am I missing? Oh, OK. I didn't get the full path to what? Items. Yeah, OK. So where are items, actually? Ah, yeah. So remember, whoops, there is a channel parent to an item. And just as we dove into movies, then movie, or rather movie, then genre, same deal here. So we can't just jump to item because item is not a child of the root element. It actually is a child of the channel element. And I'm not using XPath. I'm not using slash slash. So I actually need to provide the precise path by way of this arrow notation. Now let's reload. Ah, so that's kind of neat. I'm already now sort of dynamically pulling from the course's bulletin board these articles. Now, that's not all that interesting, right? OK, that's great. So I kind of would like to at least go there, right? But that's pretty use easy, right? So well, how do I want to change this? Well, let's go ahead and say, let's say I want an anchor href. I don't know what the URL is yet, so I'll get back to that. But now I'll do this. OK, so now again, baby step. Let's see what happens. Whoops. Oh, so you'll parse error, syntax error, line 28. I'm guessing it's this line. Uh, what am I? Oh, st stupid me. See, single quotes. What's another way, probably? You could do the slightly uglier this. That gets a little confusing, so I tend to just co-mingle because it doesn't matter by any spec. All right, so now I have links. Unfortunately, they don't go anywhere. So now let's fix this. So let me do another one of these things. The items what? Link. Let's reload. And now let's go to three questions, which has evolved into like six questions over the course of the day. But there we go. Now we're at that specific post. What about uh, this one? Permissions denied. And there we go. So again, it's pretty powerful. And in fact, here's a um, perhaps uh, stupid application of the same idea for the fall course that I teach. We um, use the same idea of grabbing an RSS feed. But if you're familiar with I can has cheese, I don't know if I spelled this right. All right, so this is a very famous, stupid, famous website. <laughs> um, right, so you know, having taken this class, so to speak, I now know to look for things like that RSS icon. And I realized, oh, they have an RSS feed of the lolcat of the day here. So I clicked on this. And then, of course, Firefox did its little rendition of this thing here. But I noticed, ooh, they also include the images in the RSS feed. And those images are probably just embedded in image tags. I kind of know how to parse XML content now and what's probably C data if they're embedding actual image tags in there. So we had. Um, we have a lolcat of today, um, <laughs> which literally just grabs via file get contents. Because again, that function accepts URLs, not just the local text files. It grabs that RSS feed. It then parses the item elements inside of it, grabs the most recent one. So I get not the, I don't iterate over the whole thing. I just grab the zeroth element of that array. I grep through it essentially looking for the image tag. I grab that URL and then we add it to the course's web page and then use the URL of the, where we got it from so that if you actually click on the image, you actually go to that same page. So it's the same idea. It's a little sexier, perhaps, than the most recent bulletin board posts. Um, but same exact idea. So I mean, this is where I think PHP and XML really starts to get compelling, because it's just so darn easy to do some of these things. And even though I wouldn't necessarily implement, say, a high performance uh, computational system in the language being interpreted and being just a little sloppy when it comes to a lot of the most obvious implementations of code, you can do some really neat things with it easily. Any questions on RSS or XML? No? All right, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we officially adjourn here? I'll stick around for a few minutes of Q&A, and then right at uh, 7.30, I'll be across the hall, and we'll do a quick intro to Project 1. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.